All right, so uh, last up before the wrap-up panel, which is next, is uh, Sterling Bates, and he's going to talk about things like personality disorder. Mm -hmm. No, tests. T tests, yes. <laughs> I'll let you take over. Great. So um, I'm going to ask questions, which means that there will be times when I'm actually I'm going to ask you to raise your hands or in some way indicate back to me. So um, I am looking forward to your audience participation. I do tend to talk quickly, so I'm comfortable with a quick, hey, could you slow down? Um, please let me know. And um, if it's a quick question, I will happily try to take it at the moment. Some of them I may table to later in the talk where I have slides covering that or where there's more time to address that. All right, so the purpose here is to talk a, a skeptical view of the science of personality type. Um, or in other words, people behave in patterns. So there's several things I'm going to talk about today, a little bit of background about myself. I'm going to talk about the science. I'm going to talk about the problems with personality models and uh, theories and tests in general. I'm going to talk about the big two, which is typically referred to as both the MBTI and the Big Five. And then I'm going to talk about where the trends are taking us right now with the science. So a little bit about the background. Um, and by that I mean I'm going to tell you about my biases. Because that way you can identify, you can interpret everything I'm about to tell you through the biases I'm about to give you. So both of myself and the company and the work that I do. So who am I? Sterling Bates. So I started with a math degree, so that's my, that's my starting point. I then got into computer science, started working on a master's, and I got into corporate IT and business intelligence. How many people know what I mean by business intelligence? Some people? Um, executive dashboards. It's all about getting the right information to the right people at the right time. There you go. And I began to realize why the reasons why most projects failed had less to do with technology and more to do with the people involved in the project. Um, so I started studying people. I got really fascinated by the topic. Um, I went all the way to become, started studying psychological type, personality type, um, did a whole bunch of master's work in psychology and psychometrics. Um, went so far as to even look at organizational development, um, doing, became a member of SHRM, Society of HR Managers. Is that a question back there? Or, no, okay. Um, and then, uh, and after that I was, I realized that I was out of IT, and at that point, um, Disney marketing stole me. So I spent three years in Disney marketing where it was all about combining psychology, statistics, business applications, and science, and software. Um, so after that, I founded my own company. So for the last four years, I founded a company called Step Research. And uh, what we do is we integrate um, psychology and business. And at this point, I'm also on the executive board of directors for the Association of Psychological Type, which is a professional organization specifically for people who are both researchers as well as people who use personality psychology and different things. So that means to say, um, I'll get a little bit more to that bias this, a little bit about my company. We literally do psychology technology. I work directly with companies in the NFL and the Major League Baseball. It turns out before you want to pay somebody millions of dollars, you kind of want to know what you're getting. Um, and in fact, sometimes those companies don't pay attention to what they're getting and they end up in trouble. Um, so I do a lot of work with that. We also look at behavior patterns. We build applications, performance statistics, predictive analytics, uh, even using it in marketing and sales and CRM. Um, it turns out everybody wants good customer service, but how they define good customer service is different. So what are the patterns that do that? We also build, we build psychometric assessments, so I actually am familiar with that. Um, we do websites for regular people, B2C, um, even all the way down to relationships, relationship psychology. So interactions between two people in a romantic relationship. So, here are my biases. I'm very interested in understanding behavior patterns. That's what I do. And I believe that there are patterns to discern. So please note, I'm bringing to it that particular bias. Um, however, I want it to be backed by math, by science, and by testing. And furthermore, it needs to be practically applicable in the real world. Otherwise, I'm not super interested in it. So those are the biases I'm bringing to this particular talk. So as we go through this, you understand where I'm coming from. Questions about that so far? Good? All right. So let's talk a little bit about the science. All right. So when we say personality, what are we referring to? Um, and so there's a couple of quick definitions. This one's pretty casual. Combination of characteristics or quality that form an individual's distinctive character. Okay, got it. Um, this one I like the bold part by me, the totality of an individual's behavioral and emotional characteristics. There's a reason I'm giving you these definitions, um, and I'll get to that in a minute. 
Um, this is a nice longer one. Um, individual characteristics of thought, emotion, behavior, together with psychological mechanisms hidden or not behind those patterns. I think this is one of my favorite emphasis added by me. The relatively permanent traits and unique characteristics that give both consistency and individuality to a person's behavior. Um, although I like the, uh, this particular expert, I like their little first sentence there. Although no single definition is acceptable to all personality theorists, which tells you a little bit of the industry right there. All right. Um, quick side note. Um, it's worth noting, um, I am not a PhD. Um, I am not qualified to send anybody to the loony bin, and nor am I qualified to prescribe drugs, just in case that comes up. Um, so there's a quick couple of comments around components that we look at any good personality model or theory that we're looking at. Consistency, right? Psychological and physiological is a key part. That it impacts the behaviors and the actions that people take. And often there's about multiple expressions. So now I'm going to also give you several more key things that are really across the board with most of the personality theories. Um, most of them take the approach that you have one personality type you were kind of born with. And certainly you grow and you change, but there's something you're born with. Uh, um, this is courtesy of Linda Behrens, who is a PhD researcher who does a lot of work with this. Um, her perspective is that on the inside, you have an innate core self. Think of that as your nature. That outside of that, you have your developed self. How you grow, you adapt and you grow and you become a better person, you learn things about the world, and that's gonna be your skill or your nurture. And then finally on the outside of that, you have your current behavior or your contextual self. And think of this as like your use day to day. So this is a quick, easy way to think about it. So often when we're talking about personality, we're trying to understand that red dot in the middle. What's that in a, that's that part that's who you are. Um, just out of quick curiosity, how many people here are, have heard of the MBTI before? You've at least heard of it. Okay, good. How many people have heard of the big five? All right. How many people know their MBTI personality type code? All right, excellent. That'll t help me uh, know where we are. So this particular is another way to think of it. You think of it as a pyramid, right? At the bottom is your personality type, like something you're born with. But it turns out that on top of that, there's how you're raised the schools you go to, the friends you have, the experiences, the culture, the work, and when it finally escapes this pyramid up at the top, that's where you get to see the behavior that someone is displaying to you. So it turns out that there's a lot of things, even if you have a personality type, and two people share the same personality type, if we're using a typing model, or they have a, if you're using trait systems, they're similar, right? then you can look at the fact that they're gonna have, they might act very differently. Personality theories, by the way, often called models within the community. Um, there's tons of them. There are actually a lot more. That, while we're going to talk about the big two, there's a ton of them out there. And they come from many different perspectives. Um, and it turns out that if you look at all the way back to both Plato and Socrates, both had models by which they ascribe different behaviors to. There's the Indian system, often referred to the Ayurvedic medicine. Um, so there's a, it turns out that people have been trying to understand how people act for a long, long time. This is not new, and there's a lot of different ways to go do that. Thousands of years of work on this. Unfortunately, I think we have a, lot way to, a long way to go just yet. So here are some different lenses by which you might look at somebody's personality. Um, again, we just mentioned MBTI. How many people have heard of Jungian type, which is often the same, just almost a, in, interchangeable? How about functions, the dominant functions, for example, that phrasing? Few people, absolutely. Um, cognitive functions, five-factor model we've discussed. Um, true colors, how many for that one? Uh, temperament, popularized by Dr. David Kiersey. That's another, another real popular one. Now, here's some more. And these meet our previous definitions of personality systems. How many people have taken the Gallup Strengths Finder? Right? Right? It's done, it's done through a lot of different systems. It's uh, privately owned by the Gallup organization, um, done by a bunch of PhDs. Um, it's actually a very good system about understanding. They call it their Strengths Finder. But in reality, when you look at that, it, is, it fully meets all the definitions that we just applied to a personality model system. So it's an example of one that's, well, people like to argue there's only a couple of big systems, but it turns out there's a lot more. How many people have Sally Hogshead, who's gotten The Seven Fascinations, anybody read that book or at least aware of it? A few? Very popular, uh, it's gotten a lot of work. Colby, anybody done the Colby before? 
few. Uh, what about Enneagram? Yep. Um, there's actually been a number of PhD researchers that have got into that one. It started as more of a mystical approach, but it's be, there's getting a lot of traction. Social styles, that one's way more popular, probably. All right. Uh, so it turns out there's a whole bunch of these. In fact, if you want to, there's a lot of sites you can go out to and find lists of personality tests. Hundreds of them. So anytime we're talking about the big two, there's actually a ton more out there. All, many of them have different criteria work in different circumstances. But not to be outdone, science. Neuroscience, this is a picture of Dario Nardi. Uh, he's somebody I work with out at UCLA. Uh, he does some really great research with EEG brain scans and personality research, although obviously it turns out there's a lot more to go. Um, also, of course, some um, fMRI has jumped into this, and neuroscience has done a bunch of work on extroversion, introversion. How many people have heard those phrases before, extroversion or introversion? Everybody, awesome. Uh, so um, how many people, just out of curiosity, uh, self-identify as somebody with maybe extroversion preferences? And what about introversion? Great. No surprise. And it turns out that this is one of those things where neuroscience has jumped into that one and has proven demonstrably in hundreds of, of different research and papers that extroversion and introversion truly do represent differences within the brain. So this is, so neuroscience is coming along to give us even more data to go make all this work. So just back we we're talking about before, these preferences, just like that innate core, is a little bit like um, natural preferences, left or right-handed. How many people are right-handed? All right, what about left-handed? A few? Awesome. All right, so I have a question. What happens if you try to do something with your offhand that you normally do with your dominant hand? Like, say, for example, use a mouse. What happens? Awkward, right? Slower, painful, right? Uh, now, here's the question. Can you do it? Sure. Um, and the same thing works, um, it, uh, if you have a really heavy box to carry, do you use both hands? Yes, of course. And so that's the, what we're, a lot of times when we're looking at personality and they're describing anything, whether it's any kind of measurement or any kind of system, very often they're talking about that innate preference, like left or right handed, which is why a lot of them say that you don't change it, or at least it doesn't change very quickly. It changes slowly. And certainly you might develop skills. For example, if you were to break your dominant hand and it was in a cast, do you think you get pretty good with your off hand? Yeah? yeah? Having done that personally, yes, you get pretty good at that, right? And it's the same way it works with anything we're talking about here with personality preferences. So would, no matter which system you're looking at, most of the time they're instead not referring to what you can or cannot do, but instead as to what's naturally easy for you as opposed to what's difficult or is going to cost you lots of energy. All right. So a couple of scientific from within the personality theory world. The theory versus the instrument. And this is one that people often get confused. So think of that as the model versus the test to work with that model. So most people are familiar with the MBTI. They think that's the model or the theory. It's not. That's just the test. Type code would be described as the theory. Just like you can have the theory or the laws around x-rays, but you have a photographic plates to measure them. Or the same thing, blood sugar, for people with diabetes, that we know that blood sugar is serious, but it turns out that we have continued to refine the tests from uh, urine tests all the way to now actually taking the blood sugar to now even stuff that get inserted into the skin to just measure it for you automatically. So our tests have gotten way better. So when out this process, I also want to make sure that people keep in track that there is a difference between the theory and the tests we have currently to make it work. Now, here's a huge one. Traits versus types. So most models or theories have at least one point where they're looking at traits versus types. So traits would be scores. Types would be categories. A great example is your, your height and weight the measurements are going to be a trait. Left or right-handed is a type system. Or white blood cell count in biology is going to, or medical science, is, your, is going to be a trait style approach, while the genus and phylum are types. So anytime, in fact, medical and biology likes to use typing systems very heavily, um, and so therefore, there, but it turns out when you're looking in the world of personality theories, you will often find systems that either approach it from a trait approach where it's all about measurements, 
what are your scores, if you will, versus other systems that like to use a typing system. In other words, which category or taxonomy do you fall into? Now, uh, it turns out, if you've been paying attention to the more recent systems, some of them may begun to use both, right? Why use only one? So they will say, this pattern of trait scores is labeled as this type or this archetype. Everybody with me so far? All right. Now, why would you use these two different things? It turns out that they have different uses in different contexts. For example, we could take each of you and go through a measuring testing process and determine from 1 to 100 your preference for right-handed and 1 to 100 your preference for left-handed. You're a right 87, left 52. Right? How many people feel like that they're somewhat ambidextrous? Right? Just naturally, it's just easy for them. So you might be, you know, right 75, left 74. Great. And is this information useful? Maybe. Is it more detailed? Sure. But it turns out in practical everyday use, most people just want to know whether you want a right-handed mouse or a left-handed mouse. Right? So that these, these things do have different places where you might use them. All right. So now here's one of my favorite parts. It turns out that with all of these theories and all of these models, there's a bunch of problems. And again, I like them. I use them as part of my work. But it's very important to be aware. It's almost like we're in a group here that's of, of, of skeptical views of how these things are built so that you understand where the challenges are and how they work. All right. So the first and most important thing, the tests suck. Every one of them. I'm going to tell you right now. I make tests. They suck. And I'm going to tell you why. First problem, people don't know themselves. You're talking, most of these are self-reporting tests. Almost all of them are self-reporting tests, which means that if you're depending upon the person to know themselves really well. How many of you have had a friend that you see from the outside and they think that they're awesome at something and you look at them from the outside and you know they're horrible at it? How many of you had one of those? So how's that going to look on a self-reporting test? They're going to tell the test that they're awesome at it, even when you as the outside observer know they're horrible. Or, um, not to pick on age, think about your average 16-year-old who's discovering who they are compared to somebody who is maybe perhaps in the middle age of their life or even into the later stages of life where they've had a lot of opportunity to know who they are. Who's going to do a more accurate job when it comes to that test? Right? In fact, philosophy likes to talk all about this idea of learning who you are, that it's a never-ending journey. So by that definition, you could never properly take a self-reporting test because you're always in the process of learning who you are. Next problem. <laughs> People lie. Even when they know themselves, they lie. And sometimes it's because they're lying to themselves. Right? They're telling themselves they're awesome. Sometimes it's because, well, they are taking a test for work. How many of you have taken a test, some kind of personality test for work? Like an employment. Like before to get, to get hired in the first place. Yeah. Scary. And the reason why is because, for the most part, it's a self-reporting test where you are instead in the context, they've shown this repeatedly, that even when you are trying to be honest with yourself, you're often thinking about what the other person wants you to answer. So even when you are doing your best, you're often unintentionally lying. But now, it turns out that a lot of people have tried to make, build into the tests ways to catch the liars. You know, anti-lie elements. But it turns out that if you're really smart and you know personality tests, um, how many of you have taken maybe 10 plus personality tests over the years? Have you begun to figure out how they work? Yeah. So do you think you could intelligently figure out some patterns and maybe answer in a particular way? Yeah. So it turns out that even, even at the level of the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, which, by the way, is the gold standard for psychopathology, i.e., this is what they're going to give you if they're going to lock you away for a while. Right? This is, that's the test. Um, the gold standard, if you are really smart, think, oh, I don't know, Hannibal Lecter. Right? You know, you're smart. You can answer that test however you want that to come out. So even the gold standard has got lots of problems. So, all right. But on top of that, let's talk about what the questions themselves are asking you. The test questions themselves are most often symptoms. They're asking you about your behavior or what you do. And the challenge is that, as we just discussed, that's actually layered through all those other factors. This means that sometimes you have problems with administering the test in, say, um, America to college students. 
which by the way is where most research is done. Um, or you're doing the test in, oh, I don't know, Japan, or you're doing it in Brazil. Um, how many people think that the questions for extroversion, introversion work great, the same ones for the US work great for the people in Japan? Uh, or, or Brazil? Right. Now, when you go look at the science, they've begun to show that people in Brazil and people in Japan have the same ratio of extroversion and introversion as they do everywhere else. But how does it look to you as the outside observer? Do they look the same? No. So their behavior is different, even if what's on the inside is the same. Now, that's the tests. Now let's talk about the researcher problem. So it turns out that how a lot of these theories get start is publish or perish. You've got to go do something. So they start with small samples. It's really expensive to do really large tests to with a lot of different people. Um, and then they're published in journals. And then somebody just says, oh, there's, and they'll publish the test in the peer reviewed journal. And so somebody else will go, oh, that's kind of cool, and they'll use it. And you get a few more. Um, but it turns out that if you go look at the guides with here's all the tests available for most psychologists to go use, the vast bulk of them are, by most practical standards, virtually untested. They meet the standards from a psychological standpoint, but they're actually not anywhere near what we, as the practical going public, might want. There are a few that have gone through a lot more testing, which is one of the reasons why you typically only hear of a few, like the MBTI or the Big Five, is because they've gone through so much more, or you hear like a Gallup Strengths Finder, because they've gone through a lot more testing. But the reality is most of them, accepted by psychologists, are not what we would consider meeting great standards. Well, surely neuroscience will come fix all this, right? That'll, go, that'll make it easy. Um, EEGs, MRIs, well, part of the problem is it's really expensive to go do that work. And in the neuroscience field, um, do you know how many subjects it takes to be considered good, good enough for a paper? Yeah, five. Yes, like right there. But it's, to me, that kills me, right? I'm looking, I want to do practical applications, so I want studies that have thousands of people in them. But your average neuroscience study, now, good ones will have way more than five. Don't get me wrong. But it's because it's so difficult to do, that's good enough for a paper, a peer-reviewed paper. Um, and furthermore, it turns out that if you're a neuroscience person pursuing neuroscience and doing new things, how interested are you in testing other people's theories? Not as much. You're, it's often much more interesting to come up with your own or look for your own truths. Gets even better. See, it turns out that the university f size affects, in some ways, how these personality tests get developed. See, if you come out of a large university, maybe something attached to a medical group or biology, you are way more interested in often observing behavior and observing how things fit together. And those people are often very excited to use, like biology taxonomies, type-based systems. But if you're a small university, which does not have a large scientific attachment, you're looking for credibility. Where do you find credibility? In statistics. That's good. Um, but it turns out that neither one of these pictures is necessarily, if you full, solely use just that picture, great. So you have psychologists using just statistics and often looking for trait-based systems because they can do statistics. And then you have type-based systems with maybe not enough observation. Last problem. The map is not the terrain. How many people have heard that phrase before? A few people? All right, so a quick example of what that's like. If you have directions printed out with a little map from Google Maps to get somewhere, is that the same thing as knowing where the gas stations are? Right? Or knowing that the destination is back behind this other few other things and you have to turn this weird stuff and it's hidden in a building? No. Or how many people know that you have to give a little extra directions when they come to your house? because the Google Maps directions aren't quite good enough to get you all the way there, right? Oh, right? This is a great example of, it turns out in actual use, right, or in terrain, if you will, they say the, that there's multiple maps, and the map is not all the story. And reality is most of these personality models and theories are just that. It's like a map. It's a map of somebody's insides, but it's a map nonetheless, and the problem is that the map is not everything. And often when it's used, people sometimes try to use the map as it's the final answer or it's everything, and it's not. Um, and that's true of any personality model. And here's, the, and here's part of the reason why, right? You can see that, that how it fits together. But think of it this way. Is a statistical average the same thing as what result you're going to get? No. And it works the same way with a lot of these personality models and theories. 
even if you take the test and you've got your scores and you have a map or a type and you want to apply that in real use, it turns out that that's not necessarily always going to help you. All right, so let's talk about the big two. MBTI and the big five. So these are the two big, two big uh, uh, personality theorists that like to slug it out against each other, uh, um, both um, slamming insults against the other as they try to point out who's the biggest and the best. Um, that's me, you know, just adding some extra flavor there. So, um, but there's a variety of tests. Most people are familiar with the Myers-Briggs, the MBTI. Um, it turns out there's a number of other very valid PhD psychometric tests that do the same thing. The Majors PTI is actually very well done. I believe out of Colorado, the Golden, and in fact, there's a million of them online. Although, um, uh, I, I, I urge you to figure out how valid they are before you go jump into those. The Big Five, the Neo PI personality uh, inventory is pretty big. IPIP, but there's also a lot of them online. So here's your clue, emphasis added is mine. It's the MBTI stands for Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. It's in the name itself. It's not the theory, it's just a test. Um, so here you go. We're gonna do a quick primer here. So again, this is your MBTI scales. How many people, I, most people I know already have their code, but these are Jung's terms. Um, he used them in a particular way, so they don't always mean what somebody else means with them. Uh, by the way, in case anybody's curious, who, who came up with the term extroversion, introversion? Anybody know? Jung. Carl Jung himself. That's where the words extroversion and introversion come from, as he came up with them. Um, sensing intuition, thinking, feeling, judgment, perception. I'm going to quickly, and then typically you take a test and it might look a little bit something like this, and then you have a type code at the very bottom. By the way, that's my personality type code, if anybody's curious. So, extroversion, introversion, it's not about your social skills, it's instead where you get your energy. So, MBTI says that people with um, extroversion tend to gather their energy from interaction, and people with introversion tend to gather more of their energy from time alone. Now, I have a, if you have an introvert, do you think that there's still times you like talking to people? Yes, and if you're an extrovert, do you think that there's times that you're like, by golly, I want to be alone? Of course. This is more about left or right-handed, right? Where do you get more energy? All right. Sensing and intuition. This is where you gather your information. People with a sensing preference prefer to gather their information from what's there around them, concrete, through the five senses. People with an intuition prefer to gather information through what it means, i.e. what it's connected to. What is, describe this apple. Oh yes, what is an apple? Oh yeah, it's red. Sensing would say it's red, there's a green stem off of it, um, the shape. Um, intuition might go apples, they go in apple pie, they come from trees. And, oh, I loved it when my grandma made apple pie. It's what it's connected to and how it relates to things around it. Thinking versus feeling. By the way, Jung referred to these as both as rational decision-making processes. Please note, this is not rational versus irrational. This is two ways of making a judgment. When buying a house, you are going to take a lot of things into account. Not only are you going to take into account the square foot and the mortgage and the money, but you might take into account whether it's going to be comfortable for your family or the people you're living with. Those are what we're referring to thinking and feeling. Thinking preference is that you have a natural preference towards objective, measurable criteria, which is my preference. But a feeling preference is where towards subjective criteria. How is this going to affect people? How will they be affected by it? How, how will I feel about it? Is this going to work for my family? Is, are they going to be happy? The last one is structure, i.e. how you prefer to create structure in your outer life. So people with a judgment preference tend to like things planned and decided, have a schedule, a plan where it fits, and people with a perceiving preference like to keep it open and flexible. So again, you will go through, you will figure out where you fit on each of these scales, and again, each like left or right-handed independently, and then you come up with some particular trait code that defines where you are. Um, so I'm going to give you a, in a little bit I'll talk about why this is broken. We use this, but I'm going to tell you why it's broken. All right. So now that was your, that was your MBTI primer. Here's your, here's your big five primer. So there are five traits. They sometimes use different names, but there are five traits. Um, each of them is designed a, around um, extroversion. We already talked about that one. Pronounced engagement with the external world, enjoy interacting with people, are often perceived as full of energy. Um, I'm going to use these phrases carefully because um, they don't really have an opposite pole. It's the absence of this. So in theory, there is no extroversion, introversion in Big Five. It's extroversion or lack of extroversion. Okay. 
Same thing with originality, openness. People who are open to experience are intellectually curious, open to emotion, sensitive, uh, tend to be compared to close people, more creative and more aware of their feelings. What's the, and the opposite, a lack of that. Accommodation. Agreeable, this is about agreeableness. Agreeable individuals get, value getting along with others. They're generally considerate, kind, curious, trusting, and trustworthy, etc. By the way, most of these you can get plenty of great definitions online, so I'm going to go over them a little bit more quickly so we can get to the great point. Conscientiousness, um, a preference for planned rather than spontaneous behavior. By the way, if anybody's starting to note some trends here, um, uh, consciousness and tendency to show self-discipline, act dutifully, and aim for achievement. And the last one, and this one is uh, uh, specifically um, not unique to Big Five compared, but is not replicated anyway with MBTI, neuroticism. To experience negative emotions such as anger, anxiety, or depression, emotional instability, or reversed and stability. So, why do these two systems fight so much? I'll tell you why. So, first of all, the, when we're talking about the type code and the MBTI, the MBI test itself is not great. Now, it turns out it's not too bad, especially when you compare it to the millions of other tests that have gotten pretty much little testing. By that scale, the MBTI is probably one of your top three, four, five tests for personality. However, compared to where you and I might want it to be as skeptics, it's not great. Part of it comes into test retest, because remember we talked about those behaviors. If those behaviors are beginning to change, then the questions themselves don't line up with your personality. Um, furthermore, in case you might have noticed that little scale when I showed you kind of where you are in that little scale of your, the scores, you're basically using a trait test for a type system. Anybody think that that might go wrong sometimes? Right? It's the, so the, the, the test itself is really designed more like a trait test, but it's for a type system. Um, furthermore, the code itself is misleading. And by that, I mean, what do we call a code? So, hey, this is my joke. See, it turns out that you use a code when you want to obscure something or make it difficult to understand. Um, that wasn't what they meant when they tried to create a type code, but I think it's created the same purpose. Um, and by that I mean the underlying theory, which is often very sound and very well heavily researched, is the link between that code and the theory sometimes leads people astray. Um, in other words, if you've ever heard the phrase, how many of you heard the phrase like, I feel like I'm both? Or you feel like you're both extroversion and introversion sometimes. Right? The letters themselves do not support that understanding of us as people. Now, the theory itself supports that just fine, but the type code letters do not. The letters themselves lead to stereotypes, which is a problem. What? It, it depends upon who you refer to. The theory doesn't support an X. Sometimes people like to do it because of this problem, right? So they're trying to fix the letters by giving you an X rather than going back to the theory and coming back to a better model. Um, now, it turns out that type, if you want to be type qualified, you want to go do an MBTI um, as a workshop or work. How many people have gone through like one of those ones at work where they do it like a half day or something? Gone through an official MBTI? Okay. So it turns out they go through several day certification. And by the time they're done, sadly, I, I wish this were true, most of the people when they're done are not good enough at explaining it to other people for what I would say is good work. Which means you have a lot of people that are exposed to type in poor ways. So it turns out if you explain the theory badly, um, has anybody ever had somebody that, they ex that was ex had skepticism explained to them poorly by someone else before you got to them? Right? It was a great, great idea, poorly explained, now you're in trouble. Right? So MBTI deals with that a ton, backtracking. Now, one of the complaints labeled, labeled against the MBTI was that the creators didn't have any PhDs. There were women in the 30s and 40s, two, a mother and her daughter working together, trying to go make something work. They'd studied Carl Jung's work extensively, and they started to go find a way to operationalize it. Find a way to take a test and go make that work, because there was no test at that time for this purpose. Um, and it turns out that if you did a lot of work for a PhD and some woman comes along without a PhD in the 40s and starts to go do something, how do you feel about that? So there is some, uh, there is some hate, if you will, um, from the, the world of the, uh, the, they didn't have PhDs. Um, uh, now, it turns out um, that there are also different versions. I know you're shocked. Anybody know what form they're on right now? Anybody know off the top of their head? Uh, they're on form M, which to and most of those have gone through those. So most of the time when you are looking at critiques, um, by the way, the most famous is probably McCray and Costa's paper on type, they're comparing it to the pre-1985 or pre-1985 version. 
in 98. It was completely redone by a team of PhDs in psychometrics, psychometricians. Large national samples. In fact, they used item response theory, which is considered a top method for reducing biases and gender sexual preferences in, in the work. And it was completely redone from the ground up. So, um, and um, they have more than, the MBTI has more than 10,000 studies on it. In fact, more, still more than the big five as far as number of studies that have been done using this paper, um, using this system. Now, big five. So this thing is one of my largest problems with the big five, so I'm gonna let you know my bias right off the bat, is that the traits are considered bad versus good. MBTI and the, bit and the type code says that both are valid. Big five says you want one side. So I want you to think about these traits for a second. That's good versus bad. Um, so again, how many people think they have extra introver introversion preferences? According to the big five, you're broken. I, sadly, that's, that, that is the, in other words, you are missing the ability to get energy and have that high energy interact with other people. Um, in fact, um, how many people, uh, INTP is actually quite common within the skeptics community, I understand. How many people have INTP references? Yeah, great example. You're really broken. So, it's a bad versus good scale. Now, it turns out that gives you a nice score that you can improve on, which if you're a psychologist or a therapist is often very good for business. You've been measured, we did work with you, and now it's happened. You've improved. Now, Matt, maybe you just improved at taking the test, but the point is, is that it turns out that's good for business, and it's also actually having a scale with measurements is incredibly useful for lots of different research and valuable purposes. Um, the, the claim that most psychologists agree is one of the ones that's often used. And while there's certainly a lot of psychologists that like it, there are plenty, again, I'm in a professional organization filled with PhDs and psychologists that like the MBTI. Um, and it turns out that per personality researchers actually like a diverse variation. In fact, if you remember earlier, they couldn't even agree on the definition of personality. How are they gonna agree on a particular test or system? Um, so there's a lot of variation on that. Um, the next thing, the big five is based upon statistically combining word choices. It's not based upon a theory or observing behavior. It's simply based on, as people took tests together, looking for where things statistically combine together. That's what it's based on. Which means that it's often missing the link to application, how to go use it, because it's about word choices. So, now here's the part that I think is hilarious. So, what's the real difference between these two systems? Well, it turns out that if you sit down and do a whole bunch of research papers, and by the way, critics and supporters of both systems on both sides have done this research, there's a really great correlation between the systems. And you probably even yourselves saw it in the, just the descriptions alone. So here you go. Those are statistically verified correlations between the different systems. In other words, with all but neuroticism, we actually have, and considering that these are completely different tests, supposedly, and different, with different methods of coming to them, to get that level of correlation, that's really high. That's way better than the height-weight correlation within America. Right? So that's actually a very good correlation. For, by the way, those who don't know, correlations go from minus one to one. I'm, uh, so therefore, that's actually that's an absolute value. They're really close. So this means when you look at type code and big five, the big two, and you compare that to all the other personality type systems out there. And you look at all the different systems and you say, how do these compare together? The MBTI and the Big Five, the type code and Big Five fighting, looks a little bit like this. <laughs> right? They're way more alike than they are different. All right, so well, where are we going from that? Well, again, we're going to look to neuroscience testing. And uh, again, this is Dario Nardi. And he's been doing some great research with looking at how these fit together with these systems. And again, he was looking, um, for reference sake, um, I'm going to go show you some slides. So uh, this is a top-down view of the brain, so like left brain, right brain. That little uh, funny little peak at the top is the nose. Those little things stick on the left and right are the ears. So this is what we're going to look like from EEG. For those who don't know, EEG studies the, the, around the top portion of it. So it's not getting into the limbic system, the lizard brain, all that other fun stuff. It's more of the conscious thinking areas. This is a bird's eye view. Again, we already know this is for right-handed people. We have a lot of research as to what portion of the brain lights up when you do certain things. So they can look at an EG brain scan, and when you're doing things, they can look at what you're doing and figure out, and it'll show up exactly in the brain as to where it's doing it. So I'm going to now go through um, 
a couple of specific examples, and you will see a type code here, but he was actually using the underlying theories like the Jungian functions to go look at this primarily, but you will see a type code. So this is an ESTJ. Does anybody here have ESTJ preferences, just out of curiosity? What about ENTJ, maybe? Uh, maybe? Okay, great. Um, so these brain type is typically very efficient. So this person is doing a storybook math problem. You know the kinds I'm talking about? Two trains are headed to Chicago. One coming from the west for 50 miles an hour with Mark. Sally's on the one coming from the east at 100 miles an hour. They're going to meet in Chicago, blah, blah, blah. So you can see that then the light parts light up here. You're going to construct a visual image, recall the details, the words, deductive reason, explain and decide. That's what the brain is doing. The black portions are not being used or at least so far below that the EG, they're not even doing it, right? Very efficient, I'm just activating the portion of the brain that needs to get the job done. Boom, boom, done. Um, by the way, he runs people through often three, four hours worth of different processes from game playing, role playing, uh, all kinds of different activities to look at what their brains are doing. Um, by the way, just in case anybody's curious, he's up to hundreds of participants. For those who are curious of the five, the number five, he's up to hundreds. This is the person doing the same exact exercise um, but they have INFP preferences. Does anybody have INFP preferences here in the audience? A few? Close? ISFP? So this, what? I'm sorry, what was the question? Yes, introversion, intuition, feeling, and perceiving. So this personality type is often associated with great deals of empathy and value judgments and ethical statements. And so when you look at this, um, they're doing the same storybook math problem. But it turns out they're also worried about the people. Mark and Sally, is this personal or business? Chicago. What's it like? Think of, look at that at the bottom, visualizing the impression and building an image, mirroring others' behavior. What's it like to ride on the train to Chicago? Their brain is doing a whole lot of other stuff. Now, eventually, they're going to get around and solve that same storybook math problem, but it's not what their brain is optimized for doing. It's more naturally optimized for understanding other people. Now, if your brain is optimized for that kind of empathy and understanding people, is that useful in other things? Is it useful when solving a math problem? Probably not so much, but it's still incredibly a useful thing to go. That's what their brain is optimized to go do. And so that's how they're starting to solve the problem. So really what we're saying is that when we're looking at this, brains work differently. When we're talking about personality, we're often truly referring to your brain works differently than someone else to them. Not in where you do it, but in how you work these different pieces together to go solve the problems. So um, sometimes we like to call those brain functions. Um, for my company, we gave them fun names for combinations to make them easy. We're gonna talk about that just a little bit here. Um, but he's continued to do more research. He started first with college students because that's what you do when you are a PhD professor. You start with college students. Um, and has since moved on into a great deal of ages. So he's now looked at uh, Jung and MBTI across a huge spectrum of ages uh, and different skill levels and different uh, backgrounds. Um, he was recently in Czechoslovakia, working with people there. Um, and so one of the big things is that it turns out what we're really talking about, this lights up as an EEG when you're using it. I'm gonna give you a little secret. It turns out when you've begun to use it over a lifetime of development, your brain doesn't even show it up on the EEG brain scan. It moves it through so fast. And so they have to use underlying theories and those are math, uh, more deep, finer level detail and it's called coherence. And think of that as the superhighways in your brain. So in other words, they can use these EEG brain scans, and you have to go through more than a couple of hours of work, and they can literally look at where your brain has created superhighways. It's called coherence, by the way, and anybody's curious, you can go look that up. Um, it's really cool stuff. And it turns out that when he looked at coherence, i.e. the superhighways burned into the brain, that there was a high degree of correlation between those superhighways and their personality types. Right? So that in other words, now again, we, we, I'm, I'm not talking necessarily cause or effect here, right? I don't know which, we don't know which one's which, but we do know that clearly you're burning it, whether it's the burn in brain that causes the personality, to be your personality type, your personality type that causes you to burn in your brain. Don't know that, but we know there's a correlation there. That this truly does, when we're in practical use describing personality type, it does represent the superhighways in your brain that your brain has figured out how to go do this stuff. And so, all right. So that's one way we can start to go do that. Another way, and this is something my company has done, is looked at how do we get rid of the code and describe it in a way that's meaningful and more practical to people in an everyday way. So it turns out that what Jung and the codes mean, he was actually looking at some different things. 
from what, how the MBTI makes it look. So he looked at two functions, sensing and intuition. And then he also said that there's also thinking and feeling. And he called the first set perceiving functions. By the way, notice you're going to see where these letter codes are coming from. That's why I'm doing it this way, so you can see that. So there's sensing and intuition, the two different ways in which you perceive the world around you. And there's thinking and feeling, the two different ways in which you judge the world around you. But furthermore, when you use those, you use one of those in an extroverted way. And you can also use them in an introverted way. In other words, I'm gathering information from the outside world, or I'm gathering information from the inside world. So when Jung was looking at it, he was thinking it more like this. According to Jung, there's only eight types, really, with two subtypes within each one of them. These would be the eight types. And so, by the way, those colors are ours. So I'm going to give you a look at what we like to think of as visual personality, which is reinterpreting the problems with the code in a way to look at what's happening with the neuroscience to guide something valuable. So this is sometimes called function attitude or dynamic functions. And we have, uh, we also like to use the word go-to behaviors to give it nice names. So extroverted sensing, introverted sensing, extroverted intuition, introverted intuition, extroverted thinking, introverted thinking, extroverted feeling, introverted feeling. And you can give those nice fun business languages. Now, stabilize, invent, connect, execute, analyze, consideration, value. Um, Susan Nash, she has her own set of names. And there's, by the way, several other people that have them own. So there's lots of places to go get this information. Experiencing, recalling, brainstorming, visioning, systemizing, analyzing. So now I'm going to just describe how this looks together visually. So the first four are how you gather information. The second four are how you decide things. So extroverted sensing, you look to the present immediate needs and explore what is currently available. Introverted sensing, look to the past, traditions, what worked. Extrovert intuition, look to the new and different ideas and explore what's available. And introvert intuition, look to how things connect, the future. So according to Jung, these are the four ways in which you gather information. That's it, right? What's around you, what you remember, what might be kind of exploring brainstorming, and then visioning where it goes in the future. And according to Jung, there's four ways in which you decide. Extroverted thinking, execute, decide based upon measurable goals and drive towards objectives. Introverted thinking, decide based upon logically correct or incorrect. Extroverted feeling, decide based upon people's needs and empathize with others. And introverted feeling, decide based upon ethically right or wrong and sync with individual values. This is it. The four ways in which you decide something. These are the four broad categories. However, four of them you use more often in the outside world when you're interacting with others, doing things in the outside. Four of them you use on the inside world when it's more of what you're thinking about on the inside and when you're, or you, when you use that quiet time. And Jung said that one of them dominates. One of them by far is what's most important to you. Everything else pales in comparison. Um, we like to call that your mental superpower. And the reason why is because when you look at it from a neuroscience standpoint, that's your superhighway. It's easy, it's fast for you, and in fact, for other people, the way you can do what you can do with that may seem like magic to other people. In the same way you might look at somebody who's brilliant at math and who can do crazy calculations in their head, but just think of this as now extending that throughout a variety of other brain functions. You've got a superhighway in your brain that you've built, and when you're using that superhighway, you're leaving everybody else in your dust. So, turns out that you use your primary function and then Jung said that you have, then the other functions come after that. And so the type code, the entire test, the entire type code was simply a way to figure out what your dominant function was and what your follow-on functions were. That was its purpose. What's been misinterpreted is that often you look at the code and you think that, oh, it's all about extroversion, introversion, or all it's about intuition sensing. But the type code was never intended to interpret the letters independent of each other. That's because according to the theory, they affect each other. So you can't interpret them independent of each other. Yet, however, that is most often how it's presented and how it's used. So this is what ESFJ might look like in a visual type system. What's most important to them is extroverted feeling. That's what they show everybody around them. All of that stuff, that activity, the consideration for others. I like to ESFJ is your movie, um, your movie soccer mom, by the way. If you're looking for a stereotype, which by the way, don't do this. For a, for, but if you were to stereotype, you would call this your movie soccer mom. 
right? And so there you can, that extroverted feeling, it's all about deciding things based upon, organizing the world around them based upon the people they care about. Getting kids to soccer, getting things built, the lunch made, all that stuff, organizing the world. Now, the part people don't see is this importance for that part underneath the line, stabilize, create consistency, traditions, Thanksgiving, the way mom did it. Now, they might draft some of those other functions, now, invent, execute, based upon what they need to get the job done. But it's all in service of working for the people around them. And they might use those other functions down below the line, introverted functions. Just like left or right-handed, do you sometimes use your offhand? Right? Sometimes you're busy holding something and you've got to go do the mouse with the other hand. It happens, but it's not going to be comfortable. So... INTJ. How many people have INTJ preferences? Way more common in the skeptics community. All right? So I like to refer to this as the iceberg type. Because what people see is that part that's above the line, that extroverted thinking, that execute, which is that part all about kind of logic, structure, and order to the outside world. But the part hardly anybody sees, unless you know them really well, is that giant, huge box under the, under the water level. That introverted intuition, um, listening and understanding how things fit together. And so most of the time, when you see this is especially common in the leadership world, an INTJ will be a manager. And, I, and when imagine that uh, an iceberg around that yellow connect box, so there's just a little bit popping up above the surface because they can see the future. They put it together in their head. They can see it. And so they will tell everybody, okay, there's an iceberg up ahead. You, everybody needs to turn left. And everybody else sees just what's on top of the water. And so they'll turn left and not realize that all the stuff below the water is what the person with INTJ or introverted intuition is seeing. And so they come back later and go, oh my God, what are you people doing? I told you to turn left. And they said, we did. And they're like, but they can't see it. And that's a great frustration for the INTJs is that it's so obvious to them. And part of an introverted intuition often is creativity. Right? There's a lot of writing. Often you find that. And so people never know that about the person unless they're a close friend of them. So this is a great example. They will use these other functions. But this is what was intended. This is in many ways what's intended by the type code. But does the type code get you to this? Not very easily, right? There's, you, you can go to the certification. You can spend four days learning how to go to get to this. Or I can just show, that you, show this to you right away. All right. So it turns out that the big five is also a, a changing and evolving as well. Um, in fact, um, there are a number of people that use the big five that have already stopped to, th to stop thinking of the big five as being bad versus good. They're converting the theory to be used differently because they're going, uh, maybe introversion isn't a bad thing. Success of books like Quiet and other actions. In fact, the most common critique of the MBTI comes from a paper by McCray and Costa. Has anybody read that paper or at least seen it? You've probably seen it referenced and even know it. Um, anybody read it? Anybody familiar? Oh, all right. So one of the things that people don't realize is that in spite of this being the most commonly cited paper cr critiquing the MBTI, if you look through it and read through it, much of what they're talking about is also is its new ways to reinterpret the test. They were not saying, let's throw out the baby with the bathwater. Because it turns out there's a lot of people who have written a ton of really good work on how to use these personality factors from the context of from the context of type code in the work, work and your personal relationships. And it turns out there's a lot of great practical use there. Do you throw that out just because the test is bad? No. In fact, there's some people that are even suggesting that sometimes the test is the wrong way to go. There's other ways to go about it. Now, it turns out that in my personal preference, I would love it if both of them would step up and make some improvements. They both need to. Um, and now, my biases in place. If you are looking for practical use, you are not a researcher who needs trait scores, you're looking for everyday practical use, then um, from a day-to-day -day interaction standpoint, that's what type systems, taxonomies, are designed around. Easy categorization for easy use. So you find that even though we know the MBTI is not perfect as a test, and even though we know that big five, they can often get you to scores that they can help you leverage and use a lot of the great information out there. And again, this is now all being backed up by neuroscience. But it comes down to actually, which system works for you? If you understand temperament and it helps you interact with your, understand yourself better and interact with other people better, do you know my recommendation to you is? Use that one. Because it turns out that many of these systems have a lot to offer. Uh, you, but you just gotta be aware of where their flaws are and make sure not to take advantage of it where, or use it in the wrong way. 
Um, so that's the slides I have. So we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I'm happy. Yes, go ahead. That's on. Uh, you said you're a math guy. Um, yes. I'll, in I'll, the history of science, a lot of times new mathematical conventions are invented for certain problems. And I was wondering if you think uh, current mathematical systems we have are adequate for analyzing especially EEG type data or if there needs to be new improvements in the mathematical side of things. Um, to my knowledge, they're improving it even as we speak, right? Coherence is actually from math, is math being applied to EEG stuff. So I actually think that there's definitely opportunities for math. Um, most people don't know this. Um, Catherine Briggs and Isabel Myers, um, developed new statistical models that are still used today to do the work on the original MBTI. How, how's that for no PhD, right? Um, uh, so it's, so the, the, the answer is that, that you know, item response theory is, a new, is, new, is actually mathematical processes that have been applied. So I think there's actually continuing to be new mathematical processes to do exactly what you're talking about. There is definitely opportunity for math to come, come to the rescue here, if you will. Great question. Other questions? Yes. I guess uh, fairly recently, Facebook, it was revealed that there were tests going on with the uh, data. Um, I was just asking, like, or I'd like to ask, how, how important is that data that they were getting from people using Facebook, and uh, what are the, your thoughts on the ethics? of gathering that data on Facebook users? Um, so, um, so I'm a math guy, so I think data is great. So, uh, uh, um, so actually, hold on, I said, um, uh, I'll go back, I'll show you something really funny. I have to work hard on this. Um, so there's this, see this values box? Way or that little tiny pink one away over on the bottom right hand side? That's the size of my values box. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, um, but, 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 in other words, I, um, the, my, my large decision-making box is actually analyze, right? What's logically correct or incorrect. So that's how I tend to make my decisions. Now, again, I, I still use it. I go apply it, but I'm like, I'm all for it. The big one is, is make sure people know what you're going to go do with the data. Um, but I'm, I'm thrilled with collecting more data. Now, here's, I'm going to give you the big risk of the data. As we just discussed, how many of the tests are good? They're garbage, and I mean that in a, in a loving, lo a nice way, because um, we use them and I make them, right? So you're always trying to make them better, but at the end of the day, how good do I think the tests are that got that data about your personality type to go use that to go in any kind of data or research? I have to question whether they did a good job of actually identifying your personality type. Um, there's a company called uh, Pico. I, it, it's a... Uh, a company that's actually done a whole bunch of research. Originally, the guy worked for um, consumer data. So these are the companies that collect all of your personal data, like when you buy cars, when you get divorced, where you live, all the zip codes, all that stuff. And he put together over 200 different criteria, and he started doing correlations to personality. So he thinks, with some 80, 70, 80% accuracy, he can look at your home address and your name and figure out your personality type. Right? And honestly, it's, I don't think it's quite as good as a good MBTI test, but it's not too bad, right? <laughs> compared to, the, to some of the tests that are out there, in fact, compared to some of the online tests out there, it's actually probably better. Wow. Right? No, that's all. And so again, that's, so I mean, there are other methods that are going on to go collect data to go look at that. But the challenge is you've already got a question is, how accurate is that data they're now collecting about the personality tape? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so with, with your... Uh, and I like your explanation of, of the type codes as being kind of superpowers for, okay, this is the way your brain's going to work best. Do you have any uh, thoughts yourself on how that could interact with the two competing theories of intelligence, the different types of intelligence in one or the central executive intelligence in the other? Um, so um, I, I don't spend a lot of time in that particular. Okay. Uh, so, but as a quick response, and so by the way, uh, my personality type, my largest box is invent look to new and different ideas and explore many possibilities. So often, this is a great example, the way I answer things is I start talking and as I, and I, as I talk, I figure it out. Yes. So, so, so therefore, I'm gonna start answering your question and by the time I'm done, I may have a different answer than what I started with. Okay, as long as, you're, as, long as we're all cool with that, right? Um, so in general, I absolutely think that there's a lot of different kinds of intelligence. Look, when looking at the superhighways and the practical use, I like personally, the idea that there's all these different ways of doing things. 
and that, and so that therefore somebody might be brilliant at one thing that's like you know musical tonality or balance. Gymnasts often do a lot of like you know internal balancing and that kind of stuff. That's not measured by many of these other systems. So I'm a big fan that there's actually ways to get the job done. Um, I know that Dario does a lot of work. So we think of um, let me see if I can find the brain one here. The top, the very front piece in here. Let's see. Do 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 is. Uh, one more, there, oh, there you go. The first, see the ones right by the nose? Explain and decide and manage processes from a cognitive EG brand saying those are the ones that are really focused on kind of managing a process, explain, decide, those are often those that referred to as executive functions. Um, and so they're obviously important, but I don't think they're in any way that they're the, the end all and be all. All the rest of the stuff is still super important. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Uh, the, it now says end. <laughs> um, so uh, so uh, I, I don't know, what, you, what do you guys want to do? Oh, it's time to stop. Okay. All right, very good. Um, hold on. If, uh, so here's the thing. If you have more questions, um, uh, I'm going to go to the end. I want you to write down. Yeah, hold on a second. Let's do it this way. I have. I'm thinking too fast. Exactly. There's a, I have my email address. I want you to please email me, and I will happily address anything else you have. I will check. There's a couple of pieces I'm using that are, are I will have to check with permission to make sure I can use those bits. Um, but I'm, I, in general, I do for most of my talks. So email me, and I will probably be able to send you the slides. So sterling at stepresearch.com.